Welcome to Expat Hoops, where we talk to basketball players who have played their pro careers outside of the U.S. Today, we talk with Philadelphia's Tyreek Duran. He starred for St. John Newman and St. Maria Goretti Catholic High School before attending LaSalle, where he earned Atlantic 10 Conference second team recognition for two consecutive years. He was a key part of LaSalle's 2012-2013 Sweet 16 squad, the first LaSalle team to do that since 1955. The team became just the second team in NCAA history to go from the first four play-in round to the Sweet 16. After graduating from LaSalle in 2014, he embarked on his professional career where he started in Cyprus and in countries like Poland, France, Greece, and Hungary. In addition to starting his career in Cyprus, he has twice been part of the Cypriot League championship teams in 2015 and 2018, while picking up individual accolades like being an all-star in 2017 and being the Cypriot Cup MVP in 2018. And before we get started with Tyreek, we wanted to not only thank him for coming on, but wanted to give a shout out to the fine folks at the Gola Standard. Uh, they do a fantastic job covering LaSalle. Uh, they follow us. They support us. You should really do the same. Uh, other than Tyreek being so gracious to join us, they are the other reason this interview is happening, as they have highly suggested we reach out to Tyreek. But before we get into his days at LaSalle, Tony, we've got some high school basketball questions for him. Yes, indeed. And I, I'm always interested in high school basketball. First of all, I have to say that uh, you went to, I went to another St. Maria Goretti High School. So I went to the one in really? Hagerstown. Yeah. Yeah. There's one in Hagerstown, Maryland. Uh, you went to the one in Philadelphia. And I actually believe like at some point in high school, I was there uh, before you were, I was there in like 2099 to 2003. And like, I believe there was some kind of like, exchange program we did between the two schools like uh, your your schools came uh, some of your students came to our school and some of their students uh, our students went to yours so like uh, it's kind of interesting in that regard um small world <laughs> what, what was like what was it like playing in the the philadelphia catholic leagues i know those are uh, we were in the baltimore catholic league which was one of the the better mid-atlantic um catholic leagues you were in another that is um always high ranking uh, what was your experience like playing uh, around St. John Newman and with some of the top schools in Philadelphia? Um, for me, I would I would like I would think that that was actually like a big part of my uh, my the start of my basketball career. Actually, like just being able to you know showcase your talent across the city and on a uh, on a national schedule. Because you know we had, we also had a national schedule every year, which helped. And but just even being in Philly, like you know, we had to play Roman Catholic, St. Joe's Prep. It's a bunch of powerhouses in Philly or whatever. So I mean, just being in that, even the, like the Pennsylvania area period, like you have Chester, you have so many good schools in that area that you can go up against. So I think uh, just being at Newman Garetti alone, that kind of put like a target on your back automatically. So it's like whenever you go somewhere to play, especially in the city, it's like you have that target on your back. Everybody wants to beat Newman. Everybody wants to beat Roman. Like that, you know, they're always the top two teams in the in the Philadelphia area for the most part. So I think that that actually got a big, got me a big kickstart to my career. And I, uh, I always thank my coaches at Newman, you know, I always stop by and talk with them, just let them know, you know, like this, was, it really all started here. <laughs> yeah, and when you were at uh, Newman Goretti as well, um, I know we, our school didn't actually, I don't think we played you in basketball, but I know that you mentioned St. Joe's Prep. We, we have invited them for like our, what would be considered a non-conference schedule that we play there. And we have a mid-Atlantic invitational tournament that we play uh, occasionally. I don't think we played your school while I was there, but I know that, that it's familiar to me um, that we had had some sort of uh, playing time together, especially back when my school was pretty good, which was like the late eighties mm -hmm. uh, back when they had Rodney Monroe on the team. Um, I don't know if you remember him from uh, NC state, like back in the, before, before my time man. yeah well it was a little before my time too to be honest I was like you know single digits at the time and certainly wasn't playing college <laughs> basketball but like he was national player of the year like three times went to the mm -hmm. went to the school and stuff like that uh, so I'm kind of a, a high school basketball nerd as well so I definitely had to get into stuff about Newman Goretti and and uh, your time in Philly as well which I'm sure yeah, was I mean, we, we crossed paths with the Baltimore uh, Catholic League yeah. a bunch of times though like uh, the math, uh, I think is, is Gonzaga considered, uh, they're, they're the DC, uh, Catholic. Yeah. So okay. they're, they're, yeah, yeah. they're DC. Um, Baltimore is like the now defunct, uh, Towson Catholic. They may have still been around mm -hmm. when you were Cardinal like, Gibbons yeah, is Cardinal also Gibbons. defunct. Cardinal yeah, Gibbons remember, is also yeah, defunct. I remember Carl, Cardinal Gibbons. Uh, St. Joe's is down here. Um, uh, Archbishop Spalding is another school that often plays, uh, schools around the area as well. The closest yeah, actually, school, I, 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 Oh, yeah. to philadelphia sorry yeah this, the closest school to philadelphia actually in the bcl would probably be john carroll which is in yeah. uh in bel-air harford that. county 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember them. We actually played the Mafia though back when they had Shelby, uh, Quinn Cook. Um, I think they had who was that? Mikael Hopkins, I think. The guy, the big guy that went to Georgetown, I yeah. want to say. Yeah, they were. Lo- oh, they had Victor Oladipo. They were loaded. We oh played them. I think we, lost, we lost by thirty at the uh, um, what's that? The the tournament in Massachusetts, the Hall of Fame Classic. Oh, yeah, they they ran us right off. Yeah, that, that that's game. the same yeah. thing that happened to us. We played Dematha like two thousand two, and I, I forget exactly who they had on that team. They had a few Division One guys. Obviously. Always loaded. <laughs> they, that that was the game in which they made twenty straight shots from the floor which was probably the most, <laughs> it was the most amazing performance of basketball I've ever seen. It's not like we played poor defense. Like they hit, they hit four or five. They were just threes. that good. They were just that good. They just kept hitting shots. Yeah. Layups, yeah. Mid-range. We're always three. loaded, man. Crazy. Always loaded. Crazy. All right. So let's get into your college uh, real quick. Your sweet 16 run in LaSalle. That was the, the best period um, for your team overall in terms of their performance. Uh, back then they were still, they were pretty good every year, but you, you had their, um, best time in the past like 10 years or so. So tell us about your time going from the first floor, making to the Sweet 16, being the first team that's really been able to make a significant run like that. Uh, that that whole year was just wild. Like I think at the be- we knew at the beginning of the season how good we were, you know, because uh, like we were coming off of, I think, an NIT year that year. And then like just coming into it that summer, we just had it in our head. Like even in practice, like our summer workouts were crazy. Like even in practice, we were going at each other's neck. And like every practice, it's just like, like, hot, like, wow, this just doesn't get any easier. Like we're going, we're all going. Like imagine all our guards just going at each other, like nonstop. And and even in the summer, we're only doing like short practices. Like you know, you can't really do like a full practice. So I think we actually knew there. And then like once the season started, and we were we were beating people, and it's just like like the offense we were running. It's like oh wow, like people really can't stop us. Like we we legit have a chance to be like how that like we envisioned ourselves being how that Villanova team with Lowry, Randy Foy, and all of them were. Like, that's how we envisioned it. And that's really kind of how we based our offense. It was like, okay, we got four guards. We got a good big. You know, we're just going to have y'all go at whoever's in front of y'all. We got, we got shooters. Like, we we had everything we needed. And it's like our whole – G's whole – uh his whole offensive uh mindset was that, okay, they can stop one person from driving, but kick it to the next person, then they have to stop him from driving. It's like we're just going to keep coming at whoever's in front of us until they stop it. Like, 85% of the chance we're going to get a bucket, we're going to get something out of it. And like once we, once we all bought into to that, and you had everybody's mind like, oh, okay, I'm I'm good. Like I can score too. Like every like no, it was no selfishness on that team. When I say it was one of like my favorite teams to play on, just because of like how selfless everybody was. Like we were all on the same page, and like you just don't find that a lot on like a basketball team. And I like to to this day I say it's like one of the greatest years of basketball of my life just because like and we were we were beating everybody like we beat nova we beat butler we beat vcu at vcu which nobody did during that time that was like when vcu was at the top of the top like they were always ranked top 25 their home yeah. record like was it was like it the a year before or a year after they made the final four from the first four it was before it, it was uh, 2011 i think okay. yeah it, no, it might have. Been, I think that was after they made. I think yeah, we. I think we. That was after they made the final. Yeah, I forget four. which year that was exactly, but yeah, I look at like yeah, but like I said, they never lost at home, and we went into VCU. We had them down seventeen at home. Like we were, yeah. we were killing them, and then, I mean they came back, but you know how VCU played. Yeah, Shaka but, Smart was still there. They were still running yep, the havoc it, defense and all that. It was uh, 2010, 2011 when they did yeah, the, yeah, yeah, the yeah. first four to the final four. Yeah. yeah, and that, it's funny because that year that was my was that my that was my freshman year in college. We scrimmaged them, we scrimmaged them that year, I believe. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So, and it's funny because I was actually I also went on a visit to VCU, but I don't know. I didn't think that they were like one of those powerhouses, so I was like, I'm not coming here. And mm-hmm. you know how that ended. VCU is one of the best schools or whatever at the time, but yeah. So, yeah, that whole year, man, it was crazy. Like I said, we were beating everywhere, everybody. I think I had like three buzzer beaters. Like even for me, like as a like as a, like for me, just alone, like it was like a great year for me. Did, in your time in LaSalle, how do you feel like that prepared you for the process of going pro? What did you do at LaSalle that got you to the point where you're like, okay, going pro uh, overseas? You know, maybe at the time you uh, obviously everybody who wants to go pro has NBA aspirations. But there were other options at the time. Maybe you discovered those while you were there and, and found out that you were going to have some interest in those who played overseas. Um, to be honest, like what, what really got me locked on to like being a pro was like, during my summers at LaSalle after my freshman year, Coach, John, uh, Coach G introduced me to Jameer Nelson's agent. And I was, uh, I was actually working out with him in the summertime. Like I was going every summer I go like, the 
LaSalle would work out at LaSalle, I was going every day with Jameer Nelson working out with him. So I started getting like that pro, uh, that pro mindset. And it was like, it was really like a, a culture shock for me just to see how, how hard Jameer worked and how dedicated he was to like stuff that wasn't even basketball related, like as far as eating, uh, lifting, like just taking care of his body. And like when I, I sit down and talk to him, like I pick his brain, you know, like I'm young, I want to pick it, I want to pick your brain. I want to know what, like, what did you have to do to get here and just talking to him? Like, I think that's what really, really matured me into like being an actual, like taking my basketball mindset from here to up here. And then like, even my dad, like when I, like, like a year after, like from like just a year of summer workouts, my dad saw improvement and he like, damn, like he watched me play. He's like, you look 10 times faster. You look way stronger than you were. And he's like, what the hell are y'all doing over there? And I'm like, listen, I can't even explain it. Like the workouts we were doing were insane. Like I, mind you, I'm in college, like we lifted, but we didn't do like the, like the um i don't even know how to explain it. like the the certain like the type of lifts that we were doing that's like the place was called summit where we used to go and it's like you do like you work out first then we do basketball but like the workouts were like all like body part specific like so say we do like something like work on agility or something to work on like arm strength and it was like every like, it was like a breakdown of every body part like we were working isolation on something work, basically. Yeah, yeah 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 and it's just like like we weren't just lifting to lift like you know in college you all right we're going to do four upper body exercises four lower body exercise exercises but it's like all basic workouts so it's like no we got the summit we were doing stuff that i never even seen like we'd go in there it's machines i didn't even know how to work like my first week in there was hell i didn't know what to do he gave me the paper with like the exercises on it. I'm like, I don't know what anything on this paper is. So, like I had to, like my first month there, I had to have like a, a, um, like a shadow just to tell me like, all right, this is how you do this. This is what this exercise is. And I, I didn't really get it down packed. It literally took the whole summer, I'd say, for me to get this paper down packed. Like, and lucky for me, one of my friends, uh, Mustafa Jones, that went to New McGrady with me also, he was already going to Summit. So once I found out he was there, me and him just like we locked back in like we, we were always friends and stuff and I, did, I didn't know he was working out there though so once I found out that he was there he was going consistently it's like all right we're best friends we're re reunited again like let's do this like we're both trying to get to the top and like he I basically like just was under his wing and you know he was showing me all the exercises and stuff but yeah to back back on that uh Jameer was really the one that just took me took my mindset from a different level and like I, to this day I thank him for that like he's like an incredible guy like a great father figure he, he's just like he's like if it was ever like a perfect human being for sports it's like Jameer like to me it's Jameer Nelson like to me he can't do no wrong <laughs> hmm. so actually here's an interesting question for you so you're talking about like you know what you would do at LaSalle and versus um you know what what Jameer would do this is fairly early on in your LaSalle career um and as far as your training during LaSalle time and now overseas, would you say that that's something that like, you know, you would still do the workouts, obviously, from a team perspective, but was it something that you were building in purposely saying like, when it's on my own time, like this is what I'm doing. And I guess kind of like maybe that contrast of, to working it in, like what you do as a team versus individually, because that's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it just helped me practice self-discipline because it's like, when you go to college, it's like, all right, we have we have time slots to work out. And it's like, okay, every college team does that. But it's like, what do you do extra? Like, what do you do on the side after that time is done? Like, are you putting in any extra work to get that extra edge over your competition? And that was something that, like I said, Jameer taught me. It's like, yeah, you know, you can work out. Everybody works out. We're basketball fit. Like, we have to work out. But what do you do extra to give you that little, that extra edge over your competition? And then, so it's like, all right, when, like, I want to say probably my sophomore, junior year, all right, yeah, we'll work out with the team. But boom, 7 a.m., I'm up shooting. And, or after practice, boom, we're getting extra shots. And like, I, like all right, we're, like, I'm, I'm looking for the guard coach. Like, yo, what time are we shooting in the morning? Like, if I get in 6 a.m., before, like, whatever, before class, before we lift. Like, we, and so then that got locked in. And uh, it was to the point where we had a, uh, we had a schedule. It's like, all right, I got to, we got to shoot before lift. Like, whatever, before the day starts we got to get a certain amount of shots up. Like we just be on a gun. We shoot for like 45 minutes. Like we got to make a certain amount of spots. Like me and Jameer uh, used to do this drill. It was a shooting drill called 10-12, where you have to make 10 out of your 12 shots, three pointers. And what it was, he's like, to be an NBA player, you have to consistently make shots. Like no matter when your time comes, you have to be able to be called upon and knock down that open shot. So he's like, this drill just is for consistency. Like, you know, 
when you do drills, like when you do shooting drills, usually you just shoot. All right, hey, we're going to make 10. Anybody can make 10. You could have the worst basketball player in the world. If you have, have him out there long enough, he's going to make 10 eventually. But this drill was like, it was practicing consistency. Like, all right, I can't, I can't, I can't miss more than three shots. So I got to lock in. I got to make sure my form is correct and everything is like, you know, like I said, consistent. So then that way, when you get to the game, you're shooting that same shot every time. And that was, that's when my three point percentage started rising. And I'm like, wow, like this guy actually knows what he's talking about. Like, everything he's telling me is transitioning to my college game. And it, like, it was, it was kind of scary to see. And it's just like, damn, like if I never met him, like, I'll be thinking like, wow, where am I? Like, where would my work ethic be? You know, so it's crazy. Yeah, and actually, one of the things I kind of want to uh, hit at a little bit as well that you mentioned that in terms of like what he's eating and everything. So, what was what was sort of like the nutrition aspects or or whatever that uh, that he was that he was doing that you looked at or like hmm, that's kind of interesting. So, I mean, my, my like my first year, he he wasn't eating like super healthy. Like we he would just take us out to eat. Like we eat certain stuff, but it wasn't like the super healthy stuff. But I noticed like when it got closer to the season, he would like he wouldn't eat as much like bad food or like if. If me and Staff would come in, like we just eating a, we're eating a pizza before we work out or something like that. He's like, yo, y'all gotta eat like fruit. Like y'all can't eat like some greasy food or some uh like fatty food before we work out. Like it's bad for your body or you're lifting and then you go eat French fries or grease, like that's bad. Like just it's just not gonna attack on the same way as like a healthy food was like a regular, like a chicken, like some car like regular carbs would do. It was just, it was like it was small stuff, it was like small detail stuff, but it's like it makes a difference. And then, like, even I think, like, now when I talk to him, like, he says he juices a lot or, like, he's, like, a lot of, like, uh, like vegetables and stuff. Like, well, I mean, you know, NBA players, they have their own stuff, so it's easy for them to diet and do stuff. But just, like, the certain things that he does to, like, maintain his body in a good way, it's, like, it's, it's decent to, like, see, like, to be around that. So I think that uh, it's pretty fair to say then probably very early on in your college career that you had at least an eye on – becoming a professional once you were done with your college career but when was it that you really thought to yourself you know all right I'm definitely doing this or, or started taking I guess maybe more tangible steps towards becoming a professional um you know in terms of lining yourself up uh to actually go overseas or or you know, explore pro professional opportunities wherever they might be actually really um I think it was that summer going into my junior year uh like I was already I think one year that was like in my first or second year after having a summer with Jameer. And then, like I said, we had just came off the NIT run that year, of my sophomore year or whatever. So then that summer leading into my junior year, the year we made it to the tournament, that's when I was like, All right, I got to lock in like 100%. Like whatever I do is basketball, like nothing else. Like, I don't, I'm not going out. I mean, I didn't really go out and party anyway, but I'm like, I'm not, I don't want to party. I don't want to drink. I don't want to be around anybody if it's not basketball related. Like everything I did was just strictly basketball related. And I'm like, I'm at a small school. I'm already at a disadvantage. Like, so we have, I have to do something to put myself on a map. And my whole thing with going to the South, I wanted to start my own legacy. Like, you know, I didn't want to go to like a, a high major school that's already, you know, they made the tournament plenty of times. So when they make the tournament, it's no real, not, not a real surprise. I'm like, I want, like me and G taught them. It's like, I'm recruiting you with the NCAA tournament in mind. And from day one, that was my stepping stone. It was like, okay, we got, I got to get here. If I don't get there, uh, my college career is a failure. Like, I didn't do what I came here to do. So that junior year is like, okay, we got the team we wanted. Like, we, Eric Murray was gone. We had a fresh class in. Like, you know, we didn't have anybody basically that, besides the people that came in as a freshman with me, we had, like, all new players for the most part. So it was like a fresh build from my junior year on. And somehow, some way, we made the tournament with that team. And it's like, that is crazy to me that we did that. I mean, besides Ramon Galloway, he, he came, he transferred after – uh, he, he transferred during my sophomore year, but like for the most part, we had a brand new team and like we ran with that and we changed, G changed up the offense. And next thing you know, boom, we're in the tournament. And like, like I said, that my whole South time, it was, just, it was a lot of stuff going on that people don't know about. And for us to even make the tournament, like it, I think we far exceeded expectations. Um, walk us through. So you graduate, um, uh, from LaSalle in, um, 2014. Walk us through, um, walk us through your graduation, and from the time you graduated until the time you land your first job at Cipher. Um, so after I graduated, I'm trying to think, I was. It's funny because the, the 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 job in Cyprus was never like even on the table. Like I don't even know where that job came from. 
we uh like my agent all summer he was talking about yeah we got a job for you in belgium we got a interest from uh israel like, he was shooting at all these shooting all these different countries at me and then one day i walked in he's like oh we got an offer from cyprus i'm like where the hell does cyprus come from like you never you never not one time mentioned cyprus to me and i was at like i don't know my, my first year my first year out was like rough too because i didn't have no summer league workouts it was actually one of the main reasons i fired my agent like i didn't i had no summer league workouts i called i literally caught the one summer league uh the one summer camp that i got invited to was actually because of coach john giannini because i he called me one day uh it was like right when i just started working out he's like yeah you know what's going on have you have you got any uh any summer league uh offers or whatever and i'm like no i'm like i'm talking to my agent he's telling me to um he's telling me to just be patient you know don't work out yet save your body you know what the hell is he talking about he's like summer league starts in two weeks or next week like you need to be he's like he didn't uh market you to anybody i'm like i don't know what he's doing i'm, I'm like i'm fresh out of college i don't know how the process works so this is literally like my first day coming back for work i was like uh so gee he's like man i'm gonna call you right back he, a lot of you now he calls me back in 10 minutes like i just got the phone with the sixers they're bringing you in monday this is on a friday he's like they're bringing you in monday for workout i'm like what the hell I'm like, i haven't worked out since the season ended like my agent literally told me to take some time off and like you know get your body together I'm like what the hell do i do now so i got in i, I ended up going to sixers uh the, the little training camp like the four-day training camp or whatever i was out of shape and like i just wasn't ready because like i said I, I didn't know like uh my agent didn't really he didn't give me the heads up that i needed in order to be properly prepared or whatever but so that's another story but uh yeah so then i ended up going to cyprus and cyprus was another story you know it was another uh hurdle it, was a, it started off rough, but we ended up winning a championship. So yeah, I don't, I don't really regret it. Now, you know, every like I said, everything is a learning experience for me. I, I don't take it as a, as a loss. I just, you know, you build off of it. Like, okay, it wasn't as, it didn't go as planned, but what did I learn from this going forward? And that's pretty much what I took from like that whole summer and that first year in Cyprus. So before you get to Cyprus, though, where had you really ever traveled internationally at, at all before? No, I never, I never been out there. As far as like um i say like the preseason tournaments like it's, that we did at the south like going to cancun virgin islands i've never been I've never even been out of the country like going to europe was never even a thought to me like, i never i never envisioned on playing in europe it was always nba for me so when that when that opportunity did present itself and you wind up going to cyprus um take us through some of the adjustments that you felt you had to make or or that were like the most memorable impressions to you at that time at, at, at this point in time that we're sitting here talking, you've played in Cyprus like three different times, uh, mm -hmm. same, same team uh, off the pod. You were talking about what a beautiful you know spot that is. And it's like a, a tourist destination, and everything, but before you, you know, have this experience, what was it like to you at that point in time when you were going overseas, trying to not only get acclimated, um as a professional but also somebody that hadn't really traveled overseas before man what's funny is i i got off the plane so when i'm i'm, I'm driving to my uh driving to my apartment they pick me up in the airport i'm driving to my apartment i'm looking outside and it's like nothing but like it looks like a desert and it was like real hot and the sun was going it was like the sunset and i just started crying i'm like damn like i'm really i'm in another country i'm millions of miles away from my family like what the hell am i about to do for nine months like I'm literally in the back of the taxi crying, like, damn, like, do I really want to do this? Then like I like I don't know that whole ride to my first, like a 30 minute ride. I'm just literally thinking, like, man, I want to go back home. Like, I don't even want to be here anymore. Like, I think I just made a mistake. Like, I should have just went to the G League or something. And then I don't like I don't know. I just I ended up adjusting fast. Like, you know, I, I went in there and did what I had to do. But that first like week there, I was waking up at four or five in the morning. I'm literally waking up with the sun. And I didn't have nothing in my refrigerator. Like the first two days, I didn't have no food in that. So I'm just waking up. I'm like eating noodles and noodles, like five o'clock in the morning. Like, I'm like, what do I do? Like, I don't know how to survive by myself. Like, I've never been in a different country on my own. I don't know where nothing is. The first car they gave me was a stick shift. I didn't know how to drive a stick shift. So I had to wait for them to find me a, a automatic car. I'm just like, yeah, I'm not going to make it. I'm like, like I'm like, I'm in my head. I'm, I'm like, I got to go home. Like, I cannot do this. This is not, this is not life to me. Like, I didn't grow up like this. I don't know what's going on right now. Like get me out of here, and like I said, it was a it was a wild adjustment period, but I mean I, I made it. So like I said, I use everything as a learning experience. And and you adjusted. Um, that was your first time in Cyprus, and you you eventually uh, went back twice afterward uh, with mm -hmm. the same team. So we'll get into the the whole Cypriot experience um, in a minute. But 
you talk about your time in Cyprus and what an adjustment that was for you. You continue to decide to go along with being overseas. So you get done with Cyprus, uh, your first year there, your rookie year, you go through all the culture shock moments, you go through all the moments where you're playing overseas in a professional league. Why did you decide to continue? despite the fact that it was difficult for you at the beginning because it, it, you you adjusted eventually but you could have said after that first year hey you know maybe i will go home you know the, this isn't what i thought it would be but you ended up in poland afterward and 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 went about your business so what was what was the decision making process for you like i mean the first thing is it's like all right do i want to quit of course i don't, don't want to be over here but it's like all right you quit what do you want to do Go home mm -hmm. and get a job. It's like hell. No, I haven't worked. I never worked. Like I, I never had a job. I never had no working experience, no internships, or nothing. So I'm like, man, do you really want to quit your dream uh, and go home and just like and get a regular job and just say, all right, like that's it. I couldn't, I couldn't make it. Like basketball overseas wasn't for me. Or do you want to like muster up that strength, that mental strength, and be like, all right, I, I beat the odds. Like I did what I thought that I couldn't, and and came out on top. But, I mean, my whole thing, like. The motivation for me was I wanted to play like Euroleague. Like I wanted to be one of them players that's making like millions of dollars. You know what I mean? Like I want I, my I, my thoughts was like, all right, I'm a I'm gonna work my way up. Like I'm not in the best the best league right now. But I was talking to like Reggie Red and I'm talking to like certain people, Steve Smith that went to the side and they like, yeah, you know, I started off in a in a small league too. But you know, I did what I had to do there and I built my I built my resume up to where I got the Euro League. I got to like Champions League and made like six figures. So. To me, that was my motivation to stay there. It's like, okay, well, something good can come out of this, you know. Like, I want to, I want to make money and, you know, just take care of my family. Like, be able to send money back home. Like, oh my, you quit your job, you don't have to work anymore. And like, it's just a dream. Like, you start envisioning a dream, and once you get that in set in your mind, it's like, okay, I got to chase that dream. Like, I got, I got to do this. Like, you know what? I'm gonna stay this path. Like, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a thug it out. I'm gonna make sure I do what I got to do, and you know, see where it goes from there. So that was and, my whole motivation. It, it is interesting, too, that you're uh, in 2015, 2016, your second stint was in Poland. Uh, we've had two people on the podcast, uh, Curry Burkholler and Fowler and Campbell, who have played in Poland. You were there at the same time as Fowler and Campbell was. He was there during that year as well, really? 2015, 2016. Um, both of them talked about how Poland is sort of a difficult play, place to play basketball. Um, and they mentioned <laughs> the travel specifically. So here oh, you are, man. you're, you're, you've adjusted <laughs> as a rookie through Cyprus and you're like, okay, I'm going to continue. You go to Poland. And what was that like? To be honest, Poland was where it all went like bad for me. Like Poland was where I got like the first taste of, okay, overseas, they don't give a shit about paying people on time. And that's that Poland really kind of broke me. Like I at that point I was like, pissed. like, so we're going, we're, we start the season off, um, so the first thing we we're, we having like hella tr uh, preseason games like like five we're we're playing like two three preseason games a week and I'm like what the hell like the season starts in like a month like why are we playing all the teams already like what is like why are we scrimmaging everybody in the league we're going six hour we're, we're taking six hour bus trips my I have I never took a six hour bus trip you know I'm I'm in college we fly everywhere if this if the trip is longer than two hours we're flying we're taking six hour bus trips we're eating like BS food on the road. I'm like, how do y'all live like that? Like, my whole thing is like, how do y'all live like this? Then we're like, we're just traveling, we're playing everybody. So then like right before the season starts, all right, uh, we, we got a, I think it was like an eight hour road trip to play a team. So I'm thinking like, all right, we're not going to stay overnight. We don't stay overnight. We travel there the day of the scrimmage. We leave like six in the morning. Four, this is for a scrimmage, not even a real game. We had a big, uh, a big guy on our team, uh, a tier mag magic. He went to UConn. So our, our, um, our physical therapist or whatever, he's like, you know, y'all probably shouldn't take this trip. You know, that's a rough trip to just go out and be uh, on a road for six, eight hours and hop right on the floor and play. So you're like, oh, no, we need this game. You know, it's an important scrimmage. It's like, I never heard of an important scrimmage. It's like, it doesn't count. Well, how is it important? So we, mind you, this guy, this big guy, he was a big part of our team. Like, me and him were like the centerpieces. So we go out there, like the second play of the game, boom, he gets hit in his, I think he, I don't know if he got hit in his knee or he came down his knee. I think he like, sprained or tore his ACE. he did something with his knee he's done for the like basically the whole seat he, he doesn't come back until almost february so now we're the only two americans on the team so now going forward the season hasn't even started yet i have to play all the way up until february without my main big guy he's he's almost he's like six nine the next biggest guy we had on our team which was our he was our center he was six five six four maybe 
he had like a disability. He couldn't really, he couldn't move his arm. Like, it was, it was wild. He could barely That's move his good. arm. He was our starting big man for the rest of the season up until February. So in my head, I'm like, okay, cool. The season's over. My season, like, I'm about to have the worst season ever. Like, this is ridiculous. And, like, that that kind of ruined my whole season in Poland. So then you fast forward. All right, we're playing. I'm doing good. I'm averaging, like, 20. I think I was, like, top three in scoring at this point. I'm like, all right, it's my second year out. Like, this is good. Then we're not getting paid. It's like, all right, come on. Like, the, so the, the first month goes by. It's like, all right, the payment was late. The second month gets there. It's late again. But then it just gets later and later and later. Like So now you look up, a month and a half is going by. I haven't gotten paid. So I'm talking to my agent. I, because my, this was the, I had just fired my agent, uh, Jameer's agent that I was with. I fired him. I got a new agent. I, was, I didn't want to take this job anyway. But my agent in Cyprus, when he first came to me, I mean, my agent, uh, that was Jameer's agent, when he first offered me the job, I turned it down. I called like three different people. Like, oh, don't, don't go to Poland. Don't go to that team. They don't pay on time. So I'm like, oh, hell no. I'm like, all right, cool. Boom fire my agent, get a new agent. So I'm talking to him. He's like, oh, yeah, I wouldn't have went there either, blah, blah, blah. He calls me back, like, probably, like, the next day. Like, you know what? I got I got one of my main guys over there. He's going to take care. He's going to make sure you get all your payment on time. He got me, like, an extra $3,000 a month on my uh, on top of my contract or my monthly contract. So then I'm like, all right, cool, boom, go there. So I'm calling – when the payment's late, it's a month and a half late, I'm calling him, like, yo, like, this was the main thing that you said you would be able to take care of. Like, this is the reason that I hired you. You said you would be able to figure this out. It wouldn't be no problems with the payment. Yeah, I'm talking to Reed. You know, they're having issues with the sponsors, this, that. I'm like, I don't care. I don't want to hear none of that. Like, you didn't – I didn't – when I signed this job, the first thing you said was the last thing I would have to worry about is my payments. I'm like, I talked to four different people, and they all said that Poland is notorious when it comes to payments. And you told me that you would, I wouldn't have to worry about that. So, like, fix this. So, boom, like, two months go by. I haven't gotten paid. They finally pay us for the one month. So, now, like, say it's in, say we're in, like, December. I'm just getting paid for, like, October. So, now they still owe me. This is the beginning of December. They still owe me November. So, now, November, that translate that goes all the way up until January. All right, cool. Y'all still owe me December. And it's just like, it's like a never ending process to the point where it got to, I think at one point they were like two months behind on the payments or whatever. And I'm like, yo, I'm not staying here. I'm leaving. My, my coach from Cyprus, uh, my, my president from Cyprus calls me and we talk, or he didn't call me, he sent me a message on Facebook, asked me, you know, how's things going? I'm like, it's horrible. I want to get out of here. <laughs> and this is right, uh, this is right before their playoffs start. So they might, they had just made like FIBA Cup. They were like, they finished like top 16 in FIBA Cup, which is like the Sweet 16 of the uh, FIBA tournament. So they're doing good. They wanted me back. I couldn't leave. They wanted me like a month or two before that, but I, I wasn't leaving, you know, because Poland was a better league or whatever. But I'm like, man, listen, I need to get out of here. So he calls me. He's like, yo, I'll triple whatever you're making. There. He's like, I don't care what you're making. My, the president that I had in Cyprus, he's like a billionaire. Like, he's like one of the most richest people in Cyprus. That's why I always go back there. Like Anytime, it's always lucrative. So he calls me. He's like, yeah, I'll triple whatever you're making there right now. Like, what's the buyout? How much do they owe you? He's like, I'll pay you whatever they owe you, plus whatever, you know, what the contract we agreed to with your agent. So I'm like, oh, boom. All right, like, let me let me talk to my agent. We can get this settled right now. So I'm like, they already breached the contract. Like, they can't hold me. So we end up getting, we end up getting out of that deal. And uh, it's funny because right before, like, I was trying, I was on the phone with my agent. I'm like, yo, we have an eight-hour road. It might have been 10 hours. We had a crazy road trip the next day. I'm on the phone with my agent now. So I'm like, yo, you have to get this deal done before this road trip. I'm like, I'm not going on this road trip because I'm not going to play. I don't want to be here. Like, it's just no point. Like, I'll, I will leave. I will, like, stay home. I'm not going on this road trip. So he ends up, like, finalizing my, my termination letter. I end, up don't, I end up not going on a road trip. I come into the gym to watch practice. The coach doesn't even say nothing to me. He asked, he asked me one question. He's like, yeah, like, why are you not practicing? Like, we about to leave or whatever. It was like shoot around before we left. And I told him, like, yo, I'm, I'm not staying here. You know I'm not staying. I have a termination letter. He's like, oh, he's like, nah, just here. He said something like slick in his language and just walked off and didn't say nothing. He didn't say bye to me or nothing. I just left. I went back to Cyprus. Made, like, I pretty much made in Cyprus in two and a half months what I was making all year, what I was going to make all year in uh in Hungary. I mean, not Hungary, Poland. So, and wow. I notice in the remainder of your career, you haven't been back in Poland for some reason. I can't imagine why. <laughs> and <laughs> you have listen. been back in Cyprus. <laughs> yes. Listen, this is, this, listen, I make a list of places that I go where I'm like, all right, yeah, this happened here. Boom. Never again. Boom. Never again. So I have a list, like even hungry, like I'm never coming back to hungry. Like 
just because like how they just what they just did to me. Like I, I'll never go back there. Like when I once I get a bad taste of a of a country, it's like I'm I can't go back there. Like even Greece, I was getting paid late. They pulled some stuff in Greece, but the Greek league is so good, like competition wise. I was like, I would love to play there. Like I, I wouldn't mind finishing my career there just because it kind of reminds me of like American basketball. Like you have you're allowed like six American players on your team. And it's it's just it just like I said, it reminds me of being back home. And I'm like, even with like the money being late or whatever, I was like, I don't mind Greece. But we uh, we might have to cut this part out just to save you here because you're talking about I don't mind getting paid. That seems like a green light to one of your future clubs being like, Oh, you hear that? He doesn't mind me. <laughs> <laughs> nah, nah. Listen, once once we sign that contract, you gotta buy by that contract. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> so but yeah, it's crazy. Theoretically. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, what's a contract exactly? <laughs> by the way, as, as our listeners might know, I'm a lawyer on my day job. So me saying that is kind of tongue in cheek. So uh yeah. So after Poland, though, you, you actually went to, to France. I mean, well, after the short stint in Cyprus, you actually went to France next, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm, I ended up going to France. I only I actually went to France. I was trying to go back to Cyprus, but I ended up, I think I ended up, like, tearing a ligament in my ankle because I left late that year. I think I didn't go to France until, like, November. And so I missed out. I had a bunch. I had a good, a couple of good job offers. I actually fired my agent from Poland after that whole ordeal, which you can imagine. Fired him, got with uh the guy I'm with now which I, I was supposed to sign with out of college but that's a another story but um so I changed my agents again he had a bunch of good offers for me uh after that year after I finished in Cyprus at the end of the year and then I ended up like messing my ankle up in like a summer league game uh in the in Philly it was like a big summer league tournament thing that they do every year I think it was like the ball up tournament I know I badly sprained my ankle to the point where I couldn't walk for like two months so I, I missed out on a lot of job opportunities that time. Then I ended up settling for Pro B in France, which wasn't at, Pro B actually was a good league too. I actually don't mind playing there, and I ended up finishing the year out there. With, so, yeah, I know the women we talked to say the 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 French league, even the lower leagues, are among the top tier in Europe for anybody, and I imagine that's basically the same for men as well. The the French league being top tier, maybe not quite on the status of something like the Italian league or something like that, or the Spanish league, but it's, it's definitely up there from what we've been told. Yeah. And even, uh, even in like France, uh, France pro B, like you'll, you'll have players there that are getting like six figures. Like it's some good, it's some good team, good mm-hmm. quality players in France pro B. So that's another league that I, I would, I wouldn't mind going back to. Uh, so you, your second stint in Cyprus, you, you've talked to us a little bit about your time in Greece. You've been, um, Basically, in in Greece and Cyprus before your current stint or the the current time that you did in in Hungary. Um, So walk us through the process of sticking with it still, because this is kind of something, a theme that I want to stick with, because you you started out difficult. You know, you wanted to leave at first, you adapted, you went through the relatively extraordinarily difficult period that you had in Poland, where not only did you have a tough time traveling, but you didn't get paid um now you've been back in cyprus twice you've been in greece twice um what kept you going through your different stints in cyprus and greece kept you wanting to play basketball overseas despite all that honestly it's just the it's the love of the game like it's it's the love of the game and i would say like the money aspect because you know it's good money like i said i didn't want to come home and get a job that's the first thing everybody asks oh you you know my dad talking about are you ready to start working i'm like no, I'm not. I'm like I'm, I'm still a good basketball player. Like I got a lot left in the thing. Like I don't. Yeah, the the on court performance was not the issue with you. Uh, yeah, and that's twenty that. points a game or whatever you were in Poland and all that stuff. It was everything off the court that was a problem. Yeah, and that's that's the thing. Like it's like I I had to I like explain it to my dad. Like it is nothing. It has nothing to do with you know me not liking basketball anymore. <clears throat> Excuse me, me not liking basketball anymore. Is more so the issue that I'm dealing with outside of basketball overseas. So it's like. I always had, like I said, I had a motivation just to play and, you know, just to see like, oh, what players are in this league? Okay, well, you know, I can have a good battle with him. Like, this should be a, this should be a good league. Like, you know, because I, I always look ahead, like, whatever I'm, league I'm going to, all right, let me see who's in this league. Oh, I know him. I, I wouldn't mind playing against him. And, like, I don't know, it's just a competitive, the competitive spirit in me. You know, I just, like, I want to keep playing. I want to keep seeing who's out there. I want to just play against different people, different leagues. And at the same time, I'm going to different places, so I'm I'm experiencing different cultures. Like that was a that was the reason I went to Hungary this year. It's like all right, I could I had an offer from Cyprus, but I was like, you know what? I haven't been to Hungary. I heard a couple of people say they liked Hungary. Like, let me see what it's like. 
then I get over hungry. It's like, okay, I don't like this experience. I'm never coming here again. I can go somewhere else next year or go back to Cyprus. Like that, like that's my, that's kind of like a pattern with me. Like I'll, I'll go to Cyprus. Then the next year, all right, I'll try something different. All right, I don't like it. I'll go back to Cyprus the year after that. Boom, let me try something different. Go somewhere that I don't like. Like I always end up back at Cyprus because that's out of all the places that I've been so far, that's where I'm most comfortable at. It's like I have a good relationship with the president. I have a good relationship with the GM. Like all the people that are in their management, I have a good relationship with them. Even if it started out rough, like we, like that was the first group of people in Europe that I had the opportunity that I could actually sit down and talk to about like my problems with them or their problems with me. And we actually come to a mutual agreement. Like it's, it's not like, oh, F you, you know, just go out there and play basketball, shut up. Like, cause that's how a lot of people, that's how like a lot of uh, staff members or GMs and stuff in Europe look at it. It's like, yo, we're not, we're not here to get your advice. We don't need help. Like with us, our decision making. Like you're just, we paid you to come here and play basketball, like do your job. When they're not really paying attention to all the off court stuff. So when I got to Cyprus, I, I was dealing with a lot of stuff there too, but it's like, all right, I could, like they saw that they couldn't walk all over me. And like, it's to the, they kind of like respected that about me. So then it's like, from there on out, they built like a relationship with me and uh, one of my other friends, Thad McFadden, they built like a strong relationship with us. It's like, you know what? Let's invite these guys over for dinner with our family. Let's let's invite these guys out to the club or to the bar with us. It's like, oh, like we're actually cool with y'all outside of basketball. Like it wasn't all basketball with them. It was like, we actually had like a friendship. And, but then like they knew when it came to basketball, like I was going to perform, like I did my job on the court. So they had no issues with me. Like no matter what they did, like as much fun as I had out there or whatever I did, if I partied or whatever, when it came to basketball, I was locked in. Like I wanted, I wanted them their championship. I took care of business. I wanted them another championship the next year. Like they had nothing but respect for me, and it was like it was mute. The feelings was mutual. So, like so, I said, I always go back there. Just, just to walk people through the timeline here. So, the two titles that you won in Cyprus that was twenty seventeen. Uh, was that one of them or twenty seventeen uh, was the last one? Twenty yeah, seventeen was one the in, last one. Okay, in the Cypriot League. It, uh, you were there. At, um, you, you I think it's 15, 15 and 18, I think 17. Yeah, you 15. Were, yeah. Yeah. So I you got, won a I championship. Got three, I got three championships in Cyprus. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. Okay. You won your. I, your I'm not your arguing first, with you on that. <laughs> <laughs> your first time around was 2015. So that was like your first, you know, go around mm -hmm. in, in Cyprus. And then in 2018, you got, the, you were the All Star in 2016. You were the MVP in 2018. Uh, mm -hmm. Was 2018 your last time in, in Cyprus? Yeah, mm -hmm. that was my last time. I think I. Uh, yeah, that was my last time. We we actually won every title. We won the cup, the super cup, and the championship. That's oh, the first time they ever did that. Yeah, right. and that's what I'm saying. Like they like that level of respect for me is so high because they know every time I come there, like I win. Yeah, when your so, partner like, team has won a treble, that's kind of. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, like, I don't you know, know of like anyone we've had thing. in the show yet that's won a treble. I think they've won. There have been people that have won cups and titles and stuff, but treble it's, is it's pretty rare. Strong. It does it doesn't happen a lot. So when we yeah. did it, it's like like we had they had the biggest celebration too, and I'm like, damn, like this is why I love it here. Like this is crazy. Mm -hmm. Like this is what I envision overseas being like. So. It was a good, that was a great experience. As I said, all my good moments are inside me. <laughs> and this Actually, team is A.K. Larnaca, right? Is that how that? Oh, uh, uh, yeah, Ike, Ike Larnaca. Ike Larnaca, okay, mm. Ike Larnaca. So yeah. here's a question for you in regards to, I mean, this really can go for any of the countries, but especially with Cyprus, uh, given the fact that you've been there for several years. What's it like um, being a player there? I mean, are you recognized? Um, and, and what's your relationship like with fans? I, I know you talked about how good it is with the management of uh, Lenarca, but uh, what's it like as, as far as being a player in some of these places? So with Cyprus, the funny thing is, like, basketball isn't even really big over there. Like, until we're in the playoffs, like, basketball is like, all right, nobody cares about it. Like, it's, everything is soccer over there. Like, even in Europe here, like, most, most, most importantly is soccer when it comes to sports. But like so all season we won't have any fans at the games for the most part. But then like if I show you if I show you pictures from the regular season to the playoffs, you're like, yo, this can't be the same arena. This can't be the same team. Like it's literally sold out, people waving flares in the crowd, flags, like the playoffs, it gets crazy. And but like all throughout the season, you won't see nobody in it. And that, that was weird because when I got to Poland. My next year, like after my first year in Cyprus, I got to Poland. It was like, oh, it's fans here. Like every game is packed. I'm like, oh, I'm not used to this. Like even like when we we're on the road, wherever we're at, it's fans. Like every every country I've been to has been like that. Like it's fans in a crowd. When I go to Cyprus, no fans in a crowd for the most part in the regular seasons. Like not empty, but it's like you'll probably see like a hundred people in the crowd. But then when the playoffs come, it's like it's a sold out arena. You can't hear anything. Like I said, they might be throwing stuff on the court. Like it's it's a completely different place. And I guess that was a that was like the main 
saying that kind of like made me think like what the hell is overseas basketball like when i first got to seven like how is nobody here how are y'all even paying it's like who's sponsoring this <laughs> every other country it was fans there so <laughs> And I guess it takes a lot for uh, people in a place like Cyprus with the weather and the beaches and stuff that they have there to get them off and out of the wine bar and into the uh, yeah. into the stands of a basketball arena. <laughs> exactly. That be- Listen, it's, it's damn near 80, 80 degrees all year round. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, that's, always- that's probably similar yeah. to playing in like Miami here is like, you know, during nah. the regular season, <laughs> call us when you're in the playoffs. We got other stuff that's, you exactly. know, out- outdoors that's nice to do. Mm-hmm. So uh, we, we have to uh, we have to get to the unfortunate, which is your recent experience in Hungary. Uh, first of all, tell us what it was like on the court and then get into the issues that you've had off the court, which you've referenced it so far during the interview. So even with Hungary, I got there a little late. Uh, I was having issues with my passport. But as far as like on the court, like my performance, I was doing OK. But I think like they just hired a coach that like they said he had a good resume, but when my when one he was from Croatia, so we had two Croatian teammates on our team. So when they started like running down his resume, they started explaining it to me. I'm like, oh, he's not a good coach. He just always had top tier players. Like I think he coached uh, what's the guy on the Trailblazers, the big guy, Yusuf Nurkic. Oh, Nurkic. He, yep. he had he coached him when he was young. So he had like uh, I think James. Guess he coached like a bunch of top players when they were younger or whatever, and he won with that. So in their mind, they're like, oh, he's a good coach, but. When you get it, like when you get like subpar talent, like like that you actually have to coach and like uh, get your X's and O's together, he was horrible. Like he like even with game plan, like we never watched film. We would come in, we would watch, we would watch like, like we wouldn't watch after the game after game film. I should say, like when we watch like film on the next team that we're about to play, he couldn't even like remember their plays. Like we didn't really scout their plays. Like he would call out like two players, like all right, yeah, we gotta stop him and him. Then we get to the game. It's a guy that we didn't mention on the scout report that's shooting ninety percent from three pointers. That we're just leaving wide open because we're helping, trying to stop another guy. It's like, yo, what is going on? Like he he didn't know how to sub. Like I it was so much going on with this guy. And long story short, they ended up firing him like six games into the season. So we ended up having our um, assistant coach coach, which he was actually he was pretty good. He was Hungarian. He used to play, and you could tell he used to play because he was he was better with the X's and O's. Like he knew how to like guard certain situations or whatever. But he didn't want to stay the head coach because he was saying, like, oh, it's a lot of pressure as being a coach. You know, he was like a legendary. He's like, I don't want to let my city down. So he coached us in like four games. I think out of four games, we went like three and four or two and four, which was better than we went with the other coach. We were one and six with that coach. So we, I'm, I'm telling him, like, yo, this, let, let him stay as our head coach. Like, I don't care if he doesn't want, want the job. Like, force him. Don't hire nobody else. They end up, end up hiring an Italian guy. This guy, when I, I used to say that the first guy couldn't get any worse. So they brought this guy in. He came in. He seemed like a cool guy and everything. I'm like, he's from the Italian league. He got. He has to know about basketball. You know, Italy has has a great one of the best leagues. But he gets in there. First first game we played good. You know, actually I think we won the first game. But then like once he got comfortable and he started like implementing his principles, it was like our team just went to shit. Like he, like, we didn't have no help side defense. He was another one like with as far as like scouting. Like he. He literally, one time we were watching a film, and it was like a top player in the league. Uh, Stefan Moody went to Ole Miss. Great player. He's like, oh, yeah, I remember this guy from, uh, he went to Summer League. He can't shoot. It's like, what the hell? My, you you turn the film on, though, the first clip on the film is him shooting a, a three-pointer from, like, Steph Curry range. And his scout report on this one guy was, yeah, he's not a good shooter. I seen him five years ago in Summer League, and he couldn't hit a shot. And we, we all look at each other like five years ago. You don't think he's gotten better five? Like he's getting six figures. You don't think this guy can shoot as a point guard in the European league on a top team? And then we're like, oh, we're like, we're doomed. So then the next game, same thing. He t- it's a point guard. He, this is the first time he got me. I, I, this is the first time in my career. Like I wasn't getting killed, but I was getting killed because he, we went against a point guard. He was like, yeah, this guy, he, same thing. He can't shoot under screens. He's a terrible ball handler. Comes out first play. I go under the screen. The guy looks at it, boom, knocks it down. Next play, under the screen, boom, knocks it down. This guy, fast forward, this guy has 17 points in the, in the middle of the second quarter. And Well, I think he had 13 in the – or he had like 10 in the first quarter, then like another – I think he finished the first half with like 22 points, all while I'm guarding him too. So I'm just like, all right, this is crazy. I'm like, I'm changing up the scout report myself. I'm no longer going under this pick and roll. So I start going under and like stop it. But after that, it's just like this is like our this is our coach moving forward. And every game he had like 
a scout report that was opposite of what we needed for that team. And we were getting torched. Like, I don't think, I don't think any games we had with him were close. And that was the one game where we got fined 20. We, they tried to find us 20% because we lost by 30. It was like a stretch where we lost like 15, 20, 15, 30. Like we, like all the games while he was there, we were getting killed and they ended up firing him. Then we uh, go back to our assistant coach where, that we just finished the season with. And he ends up playing me 40 minutes a game. My average goes from like 15 to like 29 over like the next couple of games or whatever. But just like, let me know, like a lot of these coaches overseas, they get hired and they haven't never played basketball. It's like, how are you hiring people that don't have, like, any basketball knowledge? Like, my, you can, you can find some people that can coach without playing, but it's like they got to have some type of, like, uh, like knowledge about the game. Like, even, like, our coaches, like, the last coach, he literally, like, didn't know anything. Like, we would come into practice. Instead of warming up, we would do, like, a layup drill for 10 minutes. Like, these are grown men. We're doing a layup drill for 10 minutes. Like, hey, all right, on this side, five-minute layups. Then, boom, five minutes. All right, next side. Like, why are we switching sides? Like, layups are layups. They're going to be layups on this side or that side. Why are we doing 10 minute warm up a layup? And then, right after that, is boom, five on five. It's like, yo, we didn't even stretch. Like, what, like, what the hell is going on? And I, uh, I was, that was, I think I was ready to quit after that. Like, I didn't, I wanted to go home after that. It was, that was probably, I think that was that last Italian guy. He's probably the worst coach I had in my entire career. Matter of fact, the both of the coaches that we had here were top three worst coaches that I've had overseas. And I had two of them in the same season. Like, that was nuts for me. So uh, finish up with the off the court stuff in Hungary. You got into the difficulties on the court. Now you're going through issues off the court. Um, in Hungary, like my issues off the court weren't. I wouldn't say they were. They weren't. They weren't too bad. Like as far as like how like comparing them to other leagues. Like I was getting paid on time in Hungary. Like that was never an issue. Mm-hmm. We actually got paid early. But a lot of stuff just came with my apartment. Like I was. I kept complaining to the guy, telling him, you know, my Wi-Fi is out, and he just would like drag his feet like getting it done and i'm like come on like you if i was late to practice like you'd be blowing my phone up like man i'm calling you up like my wi-fi is out one of my lights went out it took him like a month to replace the light like it was just like little small stuff like with my car and stuff like it, it really wasn't nothing too bad until uh i was ready to come home i actually told him i had a family emergency i was like you know my, my dad is having a surgery on such and such date i let him i gave him a heads up a month and a half in advance so they knew about it and um, when the time came or whatever and I needed to go home, we were, like, in the midst of, like, a playoff tournament, which is, like, whoever the last place team is, they get bumped down. So they get relegated to the second division. So the last place team over here, they only had one win all year. They were, like, 1-27. I think they ended up being, like, 2-20 and something. They, they beat us at the buzzer. So we were, we were, like, six games ahead of them. We only had 10 games in the playoffs. So I'm like, they're not kept. I'm like, they only won one game all year. What makes you think that they're going to win? Like eight out of the last ten, like it's it's not happening. They're not good. They're not going to beat any of the teams. Everybody still has all their Americans. So they call us in the office right before the playoff tournament starts because we were BSing in practice. Like they could tell that we didn't want to be here. So they like they call us in the office. Uh, the coach and the uh, manager, like you know, we just want to call you in the office and you know give y'all some motivation. If y'all win these next three, these first three games, we will let y'all go home, and we will pay y'all up until May fifteenth, even though y'all left early. So we're all like, okay, cool. Like, we were going to play hard anyway just because, you know, it's basketball. But, all right, cool. Y'all gave us a little motivation. So, like I said, first game, boom, I had 29 and 7. Second game, 29 and, like, 8. Third game, I had 35, hit the buzzer beater. I'm like, boom, cool, we're going home. Like, we did exactly what y'all told us y'all, we, y'all needed us to do, mission accomplished. So I go in and talk to him. like, hey, you know, uh, can y'all book my flight ticket? I was like, I told you I needed to be home by the 15th or – what was it? It might have been the 19th. Whatever that Sunday was after we just played, I was like, I need to leave that day. Like, oh, you know, we couldn't get in contact with the travel agency. They, uh, they're they closed, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, all right, cool. That's that's normal. You know, most teams work through travel agency. Okay, I'll give y'all till Monday, Tuesday. So I call my agent. He's talking to me. He's like, yeah, they're going to send you some fights tomorrow. Monday morning gets here. I'm in, mar- I'm in, we had morning practice. I get in there. The guy's there. He doesn't say nothing to me. I let him walk by. I don't say nothing to him. So I was like, all right, I'll give him till 12 o'clock to contact me with the flight or whatever. 12 o'clock comes. He doesn't say he doesn't send me nothing. He, I haven't contacted him or whatever. So I'm like, I'm going to call him. I start, I call him. He answers. I'm like, hey, what's up with the flights? Like, oh, you know, we were under, uh, we already had your flight booked for Thursday. You know, we have everything set in stone. I'm like, Thursday, why? I just, I literally just told you less than 48 hours ago that I had to be out of here at Sunday, latest Monday. Like, why would you book a ticket for freaking Thursday? Like, oh yeah, the GM uh 
said that that's what you told us, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I didn't tell you that. I was like, y'all wanted me to leave Thursday because we played the we played the last place team on that Wednesday. And they said we beat them. Like that thing was if we beat them, we're in the clear. But we it was a lie. We were already in the clear. They needed like to win like nine out of the last 10 games or something. It was something crazy. So I'm like, no, nah. I'm like, I never told you I wanted to leave Thursday. Y'all wanted me to stay till Thursday so I could play Wednesday. And I told you I wasn't playing Wednesday. So then I got, I was like, I hung up on him. I'm like, I got on the phone with my agent. I'm like, yo, like either I'm like, tell them to book my flight or I'll just pay my flight my own. Like I, either way, I'm leaving here. So then they started giving me like the run around. They called my agent. Like, All right, yeah, we have a flight booked for him. But, you know, Thursday, we got to change it. So my agent sends me the flight. They had me flying to Qatar, which is going backwards from Hungary. And then, then they had me flying from Qatar to New York. And I'm like, why the hell would y'all book me a flight to New York? I live in Philadelphia. That's a three hour trip. Like, so that my agent's so now my Hungarian agent, he's pissed. He's like, he's going crazy. He's like, man, I can't believe these effing guys did this. Like, they're effing idiots. He's going, I'm like, I never heard him talk like this. So it's funny to me. So then he gets them to, he tries to get them to change the flight. I'm like, listen, I'll fly to Newark, New Jersey. I'm like, that's only like an hour and a half, two hours. I'm like, I can, I can get a rental and drive from there to save them money. It'll be, it's like a $300 flight, supposed to like the flight to Philly, which is $1,200. So now they're like, all right. No, we can't do that flight because we had to pay the travel agency more money. So I'm like, all right, whatever. They booked me a flight to Philly. The flight, I had like three layovers. It's like a 20-hour total trip with three, three layovers in countries that I could have just flew straight through. So then I get there. I mean, I'm talking to my agent on the phone. He's like, oh, yeah. And they're, they're telling me that you have to pay for your luggage. They couldn't book the luggage online. I'm like, what the hell? Like, how, the, how can't y'all book my luggage when you book the flight? I don't, like, I never, I never heard of a flight being booked that doesn't allow you to book your luggage also. So I get to the airport. I end up having to pay like four hundred dollars for my luggage, which was which that damn near I'm at the total of what my flight would have been if they would have just booked me to if I would have just bought my own flight to Newark, New Jersey, basically. So I had to pay for my own flight. Then we we fast forward. As a matter of fact, let me backtrack. So before I left, I ended up asking. I had to sign my termination letter or whatever. So I asked him like, "Yeah, what happened with the? Uh, you know, y'all said y'all were going to pay us up until May seventeenth. What happened with that?" So the, the uh, manager, he's looking at me like, he doesn't know what I'm talking about. He's like, oh, yeah, we never said that. I'm like, come on. I'm like, don't lie to me. I'm like, you look, I'm like, all five of the Americans or all four of the Americans were sitting right here on this couch. We literally had this conversation before the first game. You told all of us that y'all would pay us up until May 15th and let us go home. Like, oh, yeah, you know, but, you know, we're not safe. We didn't really mean it that way. And he's telling the GM, the GM is like, oh, it must have been a misunderstanding. I'm like. I'm like, no, it wasn't a misunderstanding. I'm like, him and him, I'm like, they lied to our faces, like straight to our faces and told us that we were getting paid. I'm like, I was, I didn't even fault the GM though because he wasn't in the meeting. And you know, when you're overseas, you need everything on paper and like, you need everything to be like, like professional. So I'm like, when I look back on, I'm like, we should have never believed them anyway. Like when, when people overseas say something, you can't go off a word of mouth. So I basically like, just called them out on that. And like the, the manager was in there just looking like an idiot. He didn't really like, you know, when you catch somebody on a lie and they're not prepared to lie, like that's how he was looking the whole meeting. And I just like, you know what, it's fine. I was like, don't worry about it. I dad them both up, just walked out of it, just laughing at it. It's like, man, listen, you live and you learn. Like, it is what it is. Another year overseas. I, mean, I don't even care about it. I just book my flight home, ready to get out of here. So it's like my, my, my off the court issues weren't too bad over in Hungary, but. Thank you for watching this episode of Expat Hoops. If you want to watch more, you can find a suggested video or two over here. Also, please subscribe to our channel and hit the bell. You can subscribe easily over here. Subscribing helps us and allows us to do more cool stuff to bring to you. And speaking of cool stuff, we're excited to also announce some of the things going on over our Patreon page. So if you become a member over there, you'll get to see some of the cool new extra stuff we're doing uh, to add to our viewer and listener experience as we chronicle the stories of basketball players' experience around the globe.